Great, so our first speaker today is Elisa Ricchetti. Elisa is an Associate Professor at the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, um, and today she'll be talking about the extended normal equations, conditioning and iterative solutions. So take it away, Elisa. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. Oops. Can you see it? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so thank you a lot for this invitation. So today I'm going to present to you my work around the extended normal equation. So let's see what, uh, what is the problem we are interested in. So the problem is actually a generalization of the least squares problem. So the problem is this one in which we have the standard uh, least squares term plus a new term that is C transpose X. The solution of this problem satisfies what we call the, the extended normal equations, that is uh, this system. And so it's easy to see that uh, these two are a generalization of least squares problem and the normal equations that corresponds to the choice C equal to zero. So why are we interested in this problem? The first time that we encountered it was while we were studying uh, multi-level Lemmer Marcard method. Uh, that, are, uh, that is a method to solve uh, nonlinear uh, least squares problems, and uh, uh, that is based on a multi-level approach. Then we realize that actually this problem arises also in other applications, for example, in some penalty function methods that are uh, designed to solve this kind of, uh, of problem. And uh, both uh, this problem requires the solution of an extended uh, least squares problem at each iteration. So we decided to study a little bit uh, this problem and we had uh, mainly two different questions. So first question was, of course, how to numerically solve uh, uh, the problem. And we were particularly interested in an iterative method because we wanted to use it inside a uh, nonlinear solver. Then the second question was uh, rather theoretical. And uh, the question was how to build a good bound for the forward error on the, the solution computed by such a method. This is necessary to uh, evaluate the quality of the computed solution. And to do that, uh, we needed to study the conditioning and the backward error of the extended normal equations. So first of all, uh, let's consider the first uh, practical question. So the numerical solution of the system. So the idea is that uh, we have a problem that has a strong structure as just uh, in the case of least squares. So we want to exploit it. In the case uh, C equal to zero, we already know that uh, we have to pay attention uh, to some things. For example, we know that forming matrix A transpose A, it's a really bad idea because this would lead to a loss of accuracy and that we can uh, exploit uh, the structure of the problem to avoid uh, this uh, calculation. Indeed, uh, the residual can factorize in this way. And so uh, both direct and iterative methods can take advantage of this. So either employing a factorization of A rather than of A transpose A or performing matrix vector multi multiplication of the form A, X uh, and A transpose Y. So our idea was to extend uh, these ideas to the case uh, uh, C not zero. So uh, we decided to focus on uh, CG method. And uh, we know that for the case of normal equations, there is a variant uh, uh, of CG method that is uh, uh, designed for least squares problem, that is the CGLS. So the two methods are the same in exact arithmetic, but there is a huge difference in uh, uh, the practical behavior in finite precision. Indeed, uh, um, the main difference uh, concerns the, um, the update of the residual. So in CG, the full residual is uh, updated at each iteration, while in CGLS, only the partial residual is updated at each, at each iteration, and then the full residual is recovered by multiplication by a transpose. This uh, seems to be a little different, but actually it makes a huge difference in practice because in this case, uh, by computing the first uh, residual, we are introducing an error because of the multiplication A transpose B. And then this, uh, this error is propagated uh, because of the recursion. And uh, so this is not the case in CGLS because uh, the, it is the partial residual that is updated uh, and uh, the full residual is recovered at each iteration. 
So our idea uh, was to uh, generalize the CGLS method to the case in which we have a plus C in the system. So of course we cannot uh, apply CGLS in its uh, standard form, but it's easy to modify uh, the method to uh, let it be suitable also for our problem. So the idea is uh, really the same. The only difference is in the update uh, of the full uh, residual. So we don't have just uh, the multiplication by A transpose, but then we also add the term plus C. So the idea is really the same. It's still based on the update of the partial residual. And we can see that um, the method with this really simple modification results in a really more stable method in practice. So I'm going to show you some numerical tests, uh, in particular some performance profiles on a set of 55 matrices. And uh, uh, we take uh, as optimality criterion the, um, the relative uh, forward error. In this case, the exact solution uh, is known. It is important also to notice that uh, our problems, so the extended normal equations, are equivalent to this augmented system where we have uh, a, this uh, C that is a scaling parameter that can be set to uh, adapt, uh, I mean, to, to, to change the condition number of the augmented matrix. So uh, we compare our method that we call the CGLSC, and, it is, and that is the black uh, curve, to standard uh, CG, and then also to min res that is applied to the augmented system, and we have tested both uh, the choice C equal to one, and then also the optimal choice of the scaling parameter that is the one that allows to minimize the condition number of the matrix. So we can see that our method is by far the most robust method uh, among uh, the one that we have tested. And then even when all the solvers are successful, our method provides uh, uh, solutions that are much more accurate. We also compared uh, our method with the direct methods that are known to be backward stable. So in particular, we consider the QR method that is based on the QR factorization of the augmented matrix AB. And uh, uh, another method that solves uh, the augmented system with the optimal value of the scaling parameter using NLBLT factorization that is implemented through the MATLAB command LBL. So we can see that our method can compare with these uh, backward stable direct methods and that uh, uh, even, if, even when uh, the direct methods provide uh, solutions that are more accurate, the difference is really on one or two digits. So this is a really good result. Then uh, our second question was about uh, building some error bounds. This is an inter interesting uh, question because in the test I have shown, we were able to compute the forward error because the true solution is known. But this is not the case, of course, in practical application, so it is important to have uh, a bound uh, on the expected error. So the main question is, why can't we just use uh, uh, results uh, that are in, in the existing theory? So for example, why can't we use uh, the theory, of the theory of linear systems. So this would be natural. Actually, uh, we already know that uh, the theory uh, of linear systems it gives underwhelming results also for the case C equal to zero. Indeed, we know that uh, the, the error bound issued from linear system theory gives uh, uh, an error that uh, is of the order of uh, the condition uh, number of the matrix uh, squared. This, this is a pessimistic result because we know that uh, from least squares theory, we expect an error that is of disorder only if the residual is large. If the residual is zero or small, the error would rather be of the order of condition number of A. So um, the the linear system theory can give uh, uh, underwhelming results in many cases. So the question is, why do we have these underwhelming results? Basically, the problem is that uh, uh, linear system theory is based on the assumption that the matrix is uh, A transpose A and that this matrix is uh, ex explicitly formed. But this is not the case 
uh, for many practical solution methods that we use uh, to solve the normal equations. So as, um, as I was saying, uh, the, the idea is to use this factorization and so we would never build uh, the matrix. So um, if we want an analysis uh, to be useful, we need to consider perturbations on matrix A and not on matrix A transpose A. So we can uh, build a better error bound thanks to a structured analysis giving uh, a condition number and the backward error. And we can define the bound by the product of these two terms. So for, uh, so for uh, least squares problems, this is a really studied topic. And uh, the, the starting point is the definition of condition number. So given a function f, the absolute condition number of f is the operator norm of the Frechet derivatives. And once we have the absolute condition number, we can define also the relative condition number, taking into account uh, the norm of the data and the norm of the solution. So we can consider the case of normal equations. In this case, uh, the mapping f is the function that maps the data, so A and B, to the solution of the least squares problems, that is this one. So in this case, we can find an explicit formula for the condition number of the normal equations that has uh, this form. And so we can see that actually with the structured analysis, we can recover the known results uh, for uh, least squares problems. Regarding the backward error, the problem uh, is, uh, is this one. So we have a perturbed uh, solution of the normal equations and we want to find uh, uh, the smallest perturbation E and F on the data A and B such that uh, uh, the perturbed uh, solution solves uh, a perturbed problem that is close to the original problem. So given the set of admissible perturbations, we want to find the perturbation of minimal norm. This is a well-studied problem and uh, uh, we can find an explicit formula for uh, the backward error that is computable. So uh, the question is, why can't we just use this theory if this is good for our problem? But actually we can't because uh, the presence of term C uh, breaks the structure of the problem. And in particular for the conditioning, we have a different mapping from the data to the solution. And from the backward error, we have a different set of admissible perturbations. So we need uh, a, a new analysis. So we started with the conditioning. We defined F as uh, the, the function that maps uh, the data to the solution of the extended normal equations. This time, uh, <clears throat> the data are A, B, and C, and the solution is this. So we can prove that uh, the absolute condition number is the norm of this matrix. And we can see that this is actually a result that is really similar to the case of uh, least squares uh, of problems and of normal equations. Indeed, in case C equal to zero, the absolute condition number is given by uh, the norm of this matrix. And uh, the formula we have seen before actually comes from here. And so uh, we just have this term that, uh, that is different in our case. But even if this uh, seems um, a small modification, um, the presence of this term here uh, makes it impossible to reuse uh, the theory of uh, least squares problem. And so we had to develop a different uh, kind of analysis that led us to prove uh, uh, this result. So we have that the absolute condition number of our extended normal equation is given by uh, the square root of the norm of this matrix M bar that is defined uh, in this way. So we can see that the result uh, is a bit less um, simple than in the other case, but uh, yet this is a computable formula and uh, we can so then define a structured uh, condition number. We can build uh, examples to show that uh, this uh, structured condition number can be uh, as large as a quantity of order um, condition number of A squared, but it can also be uh, as low as uh, the condition number of A. So again, as in the case of normal equations, we expect uh, uh, the bound issued from uh, linear systems to be uh, pessimistic in many cases. Regarding the backward error, so the problem is the same as before. Just now we have uh, 
uh, we have also the perturbation on, on C and we have a different set of admissible uh, perturbations. So this problem is quite uh, difficult to solve and uh, we were not able to find uh, a closed formula for, um, for the backward error. So we used instead the linearized estimate that it's easier to compute and that anyway, in many cases, uh, it gives a really good approximation to the backward error. So we defined uh, a, a bound, <clears throat> our bound as the product of the structured uh, condition number that we have found times the uh, linearized estimate of the uh, relative uh, backward error. And so um, we, we are going to compare this bound with the classical bound issued from uh, uh, linear systems theory. So here I present some uh, problems in which uh, I compare, in which I, I compare the condition number of the matrix and the structure condition number of uh, uh, our problem. So we can see that indeed that there are some, there are two different cases. In some cases, we have that the structure condition number is, uh, um, is this, is the square of the condition number of the matrix. And in such cases, uh, the classical bound is indeed uh, uh, not so different from the structured bound, and they are both a good uh, bound for the forward error. But there are other cases, for example, problem three, in which the structure condition number is of the order of the condition number of the matrix. And we can see that in these cases, there can be a huge difference between the two bounds and that our bound is indeed much better in predicting uh, the forward error. So that's all. And uh, this is our paper if you're interested in more details. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Elisa. That was really great. Um, Min Hong, do we have any questions on Zoom? Uh, yes, there is a comment from Aindas. Uh, were your comparisons with QR and the augmented system on accuracy or time? If accuracy, then what was your starting creation and how many iterations were you using? Also, how did the time compare? If not accuracy, then what would the accuracy graph look like? So the, the measure we used is indeed the accuracy. So the optimality measure is the relative, um, is the relative um, forward error. And uh, the simulation is considered unsuccessful if we have a relative solution accuracy that is larger than 10 to the minus two. And uh, we didn't look uh, at time. Uh, but uh, regarding the maximum number of iterations, usually in the test, we allowed uh, enough uh, iterations to let the method uh, reach uh, convergence. I mean, uh, when uh, we stop it, when we see that there is no further uh, improvement. Okay, great. Marcel, do we have any questions on YouTube? No, no questions on YouTube yet. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you, Elisa, for that great talk. I will now move on to the second talk. If I can. Yeah. Oh. I'm missing, having issues. I stop sharing. Thank you. Great. Um, 